The borders of today's Middle East, and indeed many of its intractable problems, stem from the division of the region in the years during the First World War and shortly afterwards. We're joined today by Dr Neil Faulkner, author of this new book, Lawrence of Arabia's War, subtitled The Arabs, the British and the Remaking of the Middle East in World War I. And we're going to look at what happened in, to the Middle East during those years and the shadow cast into today's world. Neil, welcome. Thank you. At the time of the First World War, the Middle East was the centre of a clash of empires. Could you explain? Yeah, I mean, it, it had been dominated by the Ottoman Empire really since the 16th century, and they controlled the whole of the region that we now describe as the Middle East. It stretched all the way from the Persian Gulf right through into the Balkans, uh, and in another direction it was stretching all the way from the Nile right up to the Caucasus. Huge, great imperial complex very traditional empire though and increasingly it was preyed upon by the new European imperial powers of the age, powered of course by industry. So the British and the French and the Russians, they all had designs on the declining as it was then Ottoman Empire. So the First World War in the Middle East was a war of empire. And British policy towards the Middle East centred on three contradictory go goals. A secret agreement with France to partition the region, a promise, the Balfour Declaration, to create a Zionist state in Palestine, and this promise to create an Arab state if the Arabs rose up against the Ottomans. I mean, these contradictions could not be resolved, surely? No, they couldn't, and, and the British knew that at the time. I mean, they had uh, basically committed themselves to supporting the creation of a, of a united Arab independent Arab state after the war to encourage the revolt of the Arabs in the Hejaz region of Western Arabia because they wanted them on side obviously to weaken the Ottoman Empire but also because they were very worried actually about um, the Ottoman uh, empires, the Ottoman Sultan's appeal to uh, jihad. He'd called for a jihad, a holy war, against the British and the French and the Russians. They wanted to undercut that appeal to jihad. But at the same time, they'd done a deal with their French and Russian allies to carve up the Middle East. That was the secret Sykes-Picot agreement. And at the same time, they were in negotiations with the international Zionist movement, and they committed themselves to supporting um, they didn't say they were going to support a, an independent Zionist state, but they created the basis for that by committing themselves to allowing the Zionists create, to create a Jewish homeland in Palestine. Now, at the beginning of the war, did Britain underestimate the Ottomans' ability to fight a war? I mean, they suffered a, a couple of very serious military reverses at the beginning. Yes, and I, I think the British probably weren't alone in that. I, I, I think the general view was that the Ottoman Empire would be a walkover. It was a traditional empire. It was basically agricultural. It had very little um, industrial infrastructure. It had a very rudimentary transport system. I think the assumption was that up against powerful industrial states like Britain, France, uh, the Ottoman Empire would be relatively easily defeated. I think what they had underestimated was the extraordinary resilience of the Ottoman Turkish Islamic soldier defending what he considered to be his home territory against those he regarded as infidel invaders. Because the, the first attempt to seize Istanbul, the landings on the Gallipoli, fairly well known, ended in, in defeat. But also they suffered a humiliating defeat in Iraq as well in 1916. Yes, they did. I mean, the, de the defeat on Gallipoli is more famous, but um, equally spectacular in its own way was this defeat that they suffered in Iraq uh, in April of 1916, where you had the largest uh, British army surrender, um, mass surrender, in history up until that point. It's only been surpassed since by the surrender at Singapore which of course was an imperial humiliation in 1940. Absolutely, yes. Uh, so how important in this, here we have the British, the Turks had attacked, first of all let's get the chronology of this, the Turks had begun operations by attacking the Suez Canal which was really important for the British wasn't it? Yeah the British were very very sensitive about Suez because of course Suez was the main communications line connecting the homeland with the Indian Empire and the Indian Empire was a source of food, raw materials, manpower and so on 
um, and those resources were being fed into the, the kind of mincing machine, really, that, was, that, that Europe had become by this time. Very, very sensitive, therefore, to the security of the Suez Canal, which is why they'd taken over Egypt, incidentally, in 1882 and effectively turned it into a, a British colonial possession. It was because they needed to secure Suez. And I think that's why, initially, they put large numbers of troops into Egypt to defend the canal and then began to push them across Sinai towards Palestine and it was really to try and get the Ottoman Turks as far away from the Suez Canal as they could. That was the initial objective and then that succeeded, the Turks were pushed back and the intention then became to broaden the aims of the war into a effectively a war of imperial conquest in the Middle East. So how important to this was the revolt by the Arabs. And can you go some background to this? There'd been a correspondence between Sharif Hassan of, of uh, Mecca and McMahon in, in Egypt, the British government, promising an Arab state. And eventually there was a rebellion. Yeah, I mean, the negotiations um, go on, in fact, for years. I mean, th th there is initial discussion of this even before the outbreak of the First World War in 1914. And then it intensifies with this famous exchange of letters known as the McMahon Correspondence, where eventually, effectively, Hussein gets a commitment from the, the British that they will support an independent um, United Arab State after the war. And that becomes the basis for the revolt. And then there's a flow, of course, of British gold, British guns, British grain to sustain that revolt. Now, what I think has sometimes been said about it, the Arab revolt, is it was a bit of a sideshow of a sideshow, and the main fighting was on the Western Front, or it was in Palestine, at least in terms of the Middle East. And I think what the evidence suggests um, is that that's not right, that in actual fact, this was a guerrilla insurgency on an enormous scale which tied down huge numbers of Ottoman soldiers so that at the height of the war there were more Ottoman soldiers trying to contain the insurgency on the east of the Jordan than there were Ottoman soldiers fighting Allenby's British army which was enormous, a third of a million men west of the Jordan in Palestine. So T.E. Warrens had been an intelligence officer in Cairo, previous an archaeologist like yourself, an intelligence officer he was sent to Arabia to help foster that revolt, which had begun, but it was not going too well. Mm. How important was he? Well, there's huge debate uh, about this, uh, Chris. I mean, so many different points of view on this. My, my, my view is this. Um, I, I think Lawrence was a seminal figure. Um, I think what the Arab leaders were interested in doing was creating the, the embryo of a modern state because they had this nationalist aspiration. I think what the conventional British officers who were advising them wanted them to do was more or less the same. You need to create conventional forces to fight a conventional war. What's special about Lawrence is he wasn't in either of those boxes. He was a, he was a maverick, a misfit in many ways. He identified very strongly with the Arab cause. He identified particularly with the Bedouin of the, of the desert. And I think he was able to think outside the box and to think about the war in a very different way and to try and go with the grain of traditional Arab warfare, traditional desert warfare, and say, let's inflate this. Let's inflate traditional Bedouin raiding into a guerrilla insurgency. The kind of thing that we might in a later period call a national liberation struggle where the guerrilla is pitted against the conventional army. Uh, and this is an interesting, it was the British-led campaign in Palestine and then into Syria. It involved a, a very modern form of industrial warfare, but also this guerrilla wa uh, warfare, a traditional uh, war. How, how did that play out? Yeah, no, I mean, that's a very good way of putting it, that you've got conventional warfare on one side of the Jordan in Palestine, and you've got irregular warfare against a conventional army on the other side. And I, I think the two things work in parallel in an extremely um, effective way. But it is worth saying this. It's, it's worth saying that without the flow of British guns, British gold, and British grain, uh, to the Arabs, the insurgency would have been on a much smaller scale. Now, here's a, here's a caveat, which is very important, really, for understanding that the subsequent history of the Middle East. The leaders of the Arab revolt were 
tribal reactionaries. They were not putting forward a program for radical change that could appeal to the, uh, the ordinary peasantry, the ordinary people of Syria and Iraq. They weren't, for example, proposing uh, a major program of land reform to end the poverty of the peasantry. So the, the revolt was quite shallow. It didn't sink deep roots into Arab society. It was very, very dependent on British support for traditional Bedouin-style tribal raiding. So it's not quite the kind of conflict which, for example, we see playing out in Algeria much later or in Vietnam much later. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why it's relatively easy for the British and the French after the war to turf the Arabs out. Now, meanwhile, there's something else that's going on. I mean, the Ottoman Empire had been that, an Ottoman Empire. It wasn't a Turkish Empire. But what we'll be able to see in the course of the war is the emergence of a Turkish state and the armies that they're really fighting against increasingly are Turkish armies. Mm. Yeah, no, it is very interesting. Um, what, the, what the Arab revolt seems to do is to undermine the loyalty of the, uh, of the Ottoman Arab units. Lots of Arabs, of course, are fighting on the Ottoman side, um, but increasingly they're just not reliable and they have to be pulled out of the line, moved to other places, uh, so that the people who are filling the line increasingly are Anatolian peasant conscripts, Turkish peasant conscripts. And I think what is also happening as the as the, as the internal character of the Ottoman Empire evolves into something that is more Turkish, what you're getting is the embryo of Turkish nationalism beginning to come together. And by the end of the war, uh, you've got a kind of stiffening, despite the defeats, despite the, the, you know, the loss of Syria, despite the rout in Syria, you've got a stiffening of that Ottoman Turkish resistance as the British get to the borders of what is now Turkey. Now here we have Lawrence sent into Arabia conducting these spectacular guerrilla operations sometimes, but he knew about the Sykes-Picot Agreement, the British-French partition in the Middle East, and yet he seemed to believe that if they could get, particularly if the Arab army could get to Damascus first, somehow they could offset this. I mean, was he wishful thinking his part? Well, uh, I mean, a, a key thing um, that, that, that I refer to in the book is that there is what happened, there's no record of this, so we have to assume it happens, but I think the evidence is overwhelmingly that it did happen. There was a discussion, a private discussion, between Lawrence and Faisal, where Lawrence said, because he knew, he told Faisal about the Sykes-Picot agreement. So he brought Faisal into, into his confidence. And I think those two men, the Arab tribal leader, the British uh, wartime officer who's become a liaison officer and, and a guerrilla leader, these two men, I think, enter into a sort of conspiracy. And what Lawrence wants to see happen is for the Arabs to get first to Aqaba, to give them a forward base to move into Syria, and then to get into Damascus. And I think Lawrence's reasoning, and Faisal's, is that if they can do that, if they can project Arab military power into Damascus, they're going to be in with a fighting chance of defeating the implementation of Sykes-Picot. Yeah, when they take Damascus, the, uh, Alan Bay, the British commander, arrives and instantly tells them, no, we're handing it over to the French. Absolutely. And Lawrence has left, in many ways, from reading the book, a broken man. Yes, no, you see, I, I think what makes Lawrence such a, a supremely interesting character, if you're trying to get a handle on, you know, the last century of Middle Eastern history, is that he's, he's, he's very sensitive, he's very conscientious, he is genuinely committed to the Arab cause, in, in a flawed way, in my view. I think he's got illusions about British imperialism, but he, has, he genuinely identifies with the Arab cause. And I think he's crippled by guilt by the end of the war, because he, he emerges from it with the sense that he's led men into battle on the basis of a lie, he's led men to their deaths very often on the basis of a lie, and he can't cope with it. And he does suffer uh, a mental breakdown uh, which unfolds in the years after the war. I think he's quite close to suicide within sort of two or three years of the war. Uh, and I think Seven Pillars of Wisdom, his great war memoir, is in many ways an act of catharsis by a psychologically broken man who never really recovers fully. But at the same time, he's also been projected, both in Britain and in the United States, as this great war hero. And Britain really needed a war hero at the time, didn't they? Yeah, no, that's right. And I mean, and initially, that's exactly what he was. Um, 
uh, you know, the, the, the generals who had, who had led the carnage on the Western Front were extremely unpopular. There was a tremendous revulsion against the whole experience of the war. I mean, the entire global system was shaken to its foundations by a wave of revolution um, starting in 1917. So I think the British elite was very much looking for a hero, somebody they could put up on a pedestal. Um, and, and so Lawrence is that for a while. And then, uh, and, and to some degree still is, but I think, of course, in, in, in later on, you know, in, in the kind of post-colonial period, he's been examined in a much more critical and rounded way, most famously in the David Lean movie. I mean, the David Lean movie does actually explore the role of British imperialism in the Middle East and the way in which Lawrence is, is, is greatly damaged by what he sees as his involvement in this great betrayal of the Arabs. No, this book, in part, <coughs> was from 10 years of archaeological research you did in Jordan into the Arab Revolt. Do you want to tell us about that? Yeah, well, what we put a, we did nine seasons all together, and we put a team of about 30 people into the field for two weeks each year. And what we were doing, essentially, was we were mapping uh, all of the sites that we could relate to the revolt. So it was railway stations, hilltop forts, trenches, blockhouses, uh, campsites, and so on. Um, the most interesting thing, I think, was where we located one campsite, an overnight campsite that had been used by Lawrence himself. That was the Tooth Hill camp. And we also investigated the site of the Halat Amar ambush, where Lawrence blew up a train. It's a very detailed description of it in Seven Pillars of Wisdom. It was in September 1917. It's probably the event which is on which David Lean's reconstruction of a train demolition is loosely based in the film. And we found evidence that suggested very, very strongly that the account that Lawrence was giving in Seven Pillars of this event and of many others, actually, was very, very reliable. People have suggested that Seven Pillars of Wisdom, there's a lot of lying and charlatanism about it, you know, can't really be trusted. The archaeological evidence suggests very strongly that his description of the war uh, can be relied upon. And you found some artifacts, didn't you? We found lots. Of, yes, I have brought one in actually to show you. Uh, this, 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 this tiny little, this tiny little object has become famous um, because of. Uh, there's been widespread news coverage of it. Uh, we think, we think that it was uh, fired uh, by Lawrence himself. And the reason for thinking that uh -huh. is that it's from a. Co we think it's from a model 1911. Um, Colt Automatic, which is a new kind of American gun, which we happen to know he owned, and it was in absolutely the right place uh, for it to have been fired by lights. It was within a group of, with a group of bullets that had been fired by from British rifles, and the British, of course, were supplying the Arabs with their rifles. So we're pretty sure uh, that that bullet was actually fired by Lawrence. The partition of the Middle East went ahead straight after the First World War. There was a treaty of uh, Rapallo, I think it was, uh, where the French, the British, etc., divided it up. And mm. That is the border. They are the borders which are still there today, aren't they? Mm. Yeah. I mean, the final settlement was uh, 1921. There was a, there was a conference in Cairo. Churchill presided over he, over it. He was then the colonial secretary. Lawrence was there as an advisor. Gertrude Bell was there as an advisor. Lots of other people. And it was really 21 that finally, the Cairo Conference in 21, that finally settled it. And effectively what you had was, was lines drawn in the map because some bits were going to the British, some bits were going to the French. How they were going to administer Palestine was different from how they were, were administering Transjordan, as it was then called, different again from Iraq. So you had that, divi that, that dividing up of the Middle East, which creates the borders of today's Middle East. And, and I, I really do think that one of the reasons why the Middle East has been so divided, so conflict-ridden, has experienced so much human suffering because of that, has to be rooted in what, it, in what the imperial powers are doing at this uh, time. And it's quite easy, because today we often say that oil is at the root of all this, but actually this predates oil in the sense that they found oil in what's now Iran. Yes. But they hadn't found those oil fields in Arabia or Iraq and so on. Yeah. So it wasn't quite the burning issue that... Uh, no, that's right. It does go back before oil. I mean, oil, that they had some oil in Iran that they were beginning to exploit, and the Royal Navy, actually quite important, 
this was making the transition from coal power to oil power. So the British were very interested in oil. But it, you're absolutely right. It was nowhere near as important as it subsequently becomes. And what this shows us is that the imperial powers are interested in the Middle East because of oil, but not just because of oil. Also at this time, because it was an absolutely cr crucial communications highway, above all because of the Suez Canal. And the British in particular, with their Indian Empire and their Far Eastern imperial interests, desperately, desperately keen to keep control of this region. And the irony is, is that, uh, you know, just the, the aftermath of the First World War, the British Empire reached its height in terms of its geographical yeah. expansion. But really, it's beginning to crumble to dust because it's facing rebellions here, which mm. it can no longer police. Yeah, no, that's right. I mean, the, the British Empire, we need to remind ourselves that in, after 1918, as a result of the First World War, the British Empire was bigger than ever before. It, it ruled over more people than ever before. And yet, already it was experiencing overstretch. And it was facing revolts in a whole series of places. In Ireland, of course, it loses control of a large part of Ireland as a result of war between 1919 and 21. Um, it attempts to support a Greek invasion of Turkey. That is defeated, and, the, and there's a confrontation between the British army and the Turkish nationalists in 1922 um, across, across the, the Straits, where previously the Gallipoli campaign had been fought. They face a revolt in uh, Iraq, just as the French face a revolt in Syria. There's in the 1930s, of course, there's going to be a big revolt uh, in Palestine. So I think it's right to say that there's an expansion of the British Empire to, the, to its greatest extent at this time, but it's also now facing a major, major problem of overstretch, and we're seeing that in these revolts of the subject peoples that are bubbling up. So is it lazy history? Or can we say that the problems, the overwhelming problems the Middle East faces today, the existence of the State of Israel, the problems of Palestine, the civil war and so all of this flows from decisions made in the main by British politicians in those years during and shortly after the First World War. Yes, I think if you want to understand the modern Middle East, you need to know what the British Empire is doing between 1916 and 1921. They create the modern Middle East, yes. And we've had many books about war in Arabia, a blockbuster film which you mentioned, many TV programmes. Why another one? Well, I, I mean, what the book tries to do is to look at the whole experience of the conflict in a multidisciplinary way. So it's not just military history, it's also political history, it's also looking at the anthropology and the sociology, how, does these, how do these societies work, it's all of that. And it's looking at what's happening east of the Jordan, the Arab Revolt, and west of the Jordan, the campaign in Palestine, at the same time and seeing it all as a single military process that is transforming the region. So it's a holistic study of the war in the Middle East between 1914 and 1918. And for a book which is critical of, uh, of Britain and British imperialism, it's received some quite good reviews in the, the right-wing media. Yes, it has. I mean, a, a good review in The Spectator and a good review in The Daily Telegraph as well, which is quite pleasing because it is a radical text. It is an anti-imperialist uh, uh, text, but I hope it will appeal to a very, very broad readership uh, indeed because obviously I stand by everything I say in it and I think that all of us need to face up to the reality of what the British Empire is responsible for in the crisis which the Middle East has, has been in, in some sense, for the last hundred years. Dr Neil Faulkner, thank you very much indeed. This is Chris Banbury thanking you for tuning in, and I hope you learned something about what created today's Middle East, and also what created some of the problems that we're having to live through in that most vital region. Thank you. <laughs>